G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our Economics of a Pandemic webinar series. Uh, thanks for joining us today uh, and thanks everyone who joined us last week while I was on leave and hosted uh, by the very capable Leanne Mitchell last week. Thanks uh, for coming along there. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and work. Canberra's Ngunnawal country. It's a beautiful day here in Ngunnawal country today. And I acknowledge that the sovereignty was never ceded and pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd also like to extend a welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people joining us in the webinar today. Uh, during the pandemic, the Australia Institute is aiming to do these webinars at least weekly, but days and times do vary. We've got two on this week, for example. So make sure you head over to our website uh, so that you don't miss out on anything. And a few tips just before we begin to make sure that this webinar runs smoothly. For those joining us for the first time today, if you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you'll be able to ask questions of our panelists. You should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments on other people's questions. Uh, if you would like to ask the panel a question live, there's a raise your hand function and a little hand icon will come up like this. Uh, and I'll call on you in the second half of the webinar when we go to the Q&A with you, the audience. Um, please keep things civil in the chat. You will be removed if you can't do that. Not that we've had a huge amount of trouble over the past six months with that, but just a nice reminder uh, that we like to keep things uh, civil. Uh, and finally, a reminder, oh, I will say one more thing about the chat. Some people find it really annoying when the comments pop up. If you click on the chat, it will come up as a separate pop-up and you can just kind of put it to the side on your screen. Uh, but we do like the conversation that happens in the chat, so we're not going to turn um, that off. Lastly, this discussion is being recorded and will be posted on our website and emailed to everyone who has registered after this webinar. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. We've had more than 1,300 people RSVP. So clearly huge interest in the issue of aged care and aging well at home. And of course, aged care has been thrust into the centre of the pandemic spotlight lately, with more than a thousand COVID cases and a tragic 600 deaths taking place in residential aged care facilities across the country, but mainly in Victoria. But even before the pandemic, uh, it was obvious that all was not well with Australia's aged care system. In 2018, a Royal Commission was established into aged care quality and safety following a series of shocking and frankly horrifying scandals. Uh, and as is so often the case, a powerful report from the ABC's Four Corners. The Royal Commission's interim report in October last year did not hold back in its criticism saying that, quote, as a nation, Australia has drifted into an ageist mindset that undervalues older people and limits their possibilities. Sadly, that this failure to properly value and engage with older people as equal partners in our future has extended to our apparent indifference towards aged care services. Left out of sight and out of mind, these services are floundering, fragmented, unsupported and underfunded. With some admirable exceptions, they are poorly managed and all too often they are unsafe and seemingly uncaring and that this must change. So of course, coronavirus has exposed poor policy and bad management across a range of areas. And with this background, aged care has been no reception, uh, no exception. So how do we find ourselves in this mess and how do we get out of it? And what are some of the alternatives to residential aged care? We've got three really exciting guests to help me sort this out today. Jed Carney is the federal member for Cooper and the shadow assistant minister for aged care. Jed started her working life as a nurse and rose to become federal secretary of the Australian Nursing Federation. In 2010, she served as the president of the ACTU, the peak body of Australia's union movement. So a long history with aged care and nursing from uh, Jed Carney there. We're delighted to have her with us. Ferris Campbell has been involved in residential and home-based care for over 40 years. She's been the main driver for Home Share in Australia, a program that brings together older householders with people of integrity who are prepared to lend a hand in return for affordable accommodation. She's founded and sat upon the boards of residential aged care facilities, and she's currently an advisor to Casper Care, a long-standing not-for-profit body set up by the community to provide aged care in South Melbourne. And Ruth Kesterman is the CEO of Holdsworth Community, which provides community support across Sydney, particularly its eastern suburbs. 
Holdsworth supports older people who require assistance to remain living meaningful lives at home and connected to their community. Ruth joined Holdsworth in 2014 after 14 years working as a project manager, engineer and consultant in the private government and not-for-profit sector, and she became CEO in 2017. Um, Jed Carney, thank you uh, so much for joining us today. We're going to start with you. Mm -hmm. Would you mind giving us a bit of the history that has shaped our aged care system from your time as a nurse to now being the shadow assistant minister? What have been some of the big um, changes and trends that you've seen over this time? Um, thanks very much. And Ebony, can I start by acknowledging that I am on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'm glad you started your commentary by um, saying that what's happened during the pandemic has really highlighted some severe systemic <coughs> problems that have existed for a long time that many of us have been fighting to change. Uh, ever since you know, my entire life as a nurse and in the union movement and at the ACTU, we've been arguing for a better system for aged care. And I found it absolutely astounding that uh, that the federal government seemed to be trying to abrogate responsibility from this, uh, the, the outbreak, when clearly this is squarely on the shoulders of the federal government. I remember Scott Morrison saying, or the Prime Minister saying, you know, what did you want me to do? Put a force field around aged care. Well, yeah, you should have put a force field around aged care, absolutely. Uh, we knew from the Dorothy Henderson outbreak and the, the New March House outbreak in New South Wales, everything that really needed to be done to protect the elderly who we knew were most vulnerable from around the world. You just said, look, all around the world, we knew that the pandemic was going to hit our elderly um, in greater proportion to the rest of the population. So there should have been a force field put around aged care. And uh, you just have to look back at the, at the history, as you say, to see exactly where that force field needed to be put and what it needed to consist of. I'm old and I've been around a long time. And um, so I remember um, back before the 1997 Aged Care Act was written and aged care was funded differently and it was run differently. It was uh, much more involvement with state provision of services. There was the funding system recognised the need for um, there to be funding for capital works as well as care works. Uh, there were requirements of uh, different skill levels of people working in aged care facilities from nurses, carers, um, and, and, and doctors, et cetera, the care that needed to be given. Um, over time, there's been a lot of change since the Act was written, really. Um, the funding model has changed dramatically. We know that bonds um, came into the picture, which made it very attractive for people who managed money. It became an interesting investment for people to sort, who saw it perhaps as, a, um, as a, a, a wealth management sector rather than a care sector. We had the for-profit sector coming in heavily, we had, um, uh, uh, we, I remember nursing homes where people actually would drive up to come home, people were that well when they went into residential care. Um, of course, it's changed now where people are wanting to stay much more at home and we'll talk a bit more about that, ageing at home and how we can help that. And that residential aged care facilities have really become more end of life care, uh, very complex care, people with dementia, multiple morbidities, people requiring um, that really intense end of life and perhaps even palliative care. Uh, we've seen states pretty much exit the, um, the system. Uh, in Victoria, there are still some state-run facilities. In Queensland, I think there may be some, but by and large, it's run now by the not-for-profit sector and the, the for-private and the, um, the for-profit sector. And of course, there are some services that are run by local governments, but again, this is also patchy across the country. Uh, in Victoria, we still have some local governments, and I'm, I'm not sure, I think maybe New South Wales, but, um, and, and that, that is quite patchy, the provision that is provided there, and of course, it's funded differently, which I know is a concern for Hansa. Uh, we've seen a massive shift in how nursing homes uh, or residential aged care facilities are staffed. There's massive problems with the workforce. They are low paid, predominantly female. Um, they are, uh, there's, there's part-time, casual. We even have in some facilities zero contract hours. Like employment um, uh, is, is an issue in the sector, which of course has presented a lot of problems for the pandemic because people have to work across multiple facilities to make a living. 
Um, there's no minimum staffing level requirements, no skill mix requirements, no minimum qualification requirements. Uh, it, it really, um, it, it, I think that is something that really needs to be addressed and that is an issue. And of course, a huge issue that's been in the media recently is the lack of transparency and accountability with mm -hmm. government funding. Um, that you know they, they do have to acquit some ways, but certainly not to the level that I would expect uh, anyone who is funded to the to the level that the sector is funded with government taxpayers funding. There should be more acquittal and accountability for that. Uh, very little public reporting around maintenance of standards. And the last thing I want to say about residential aged care is that we need a regulator and a compliancy model that has teeth that can actually make a difference for the sector. And I think that um, we really need to look at how that is, um, is written. There was a very, uh, very interesting article in the Saturday paper written by Rick Morton that if anybody would like to have a look at, gives a very good analysis of the changes in aged care over time, um, in quite in depth. So uh, yeah, we, so what we see now is um, a very, uh, uh, sector that has been taken up by has you know been lost control from the state we have a federal government that says we just fund it you know we don't really have a role in delivery anymore which i would argue strongly that that is not the case they really do have a role in maintaining standards monitoring and compliance and accountability and transparency uh, we also know that there's been a big shift in people wanting to stay home and age at home and I think we, we have, I think about 150,000 people waiting for home care packages. Tens of thousands of people have died waiting for their package at home. Uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to get your package reviewed if you are ailing and getting, needing more and more care over time. Uh, the issue with home care packages is quite serious. And I know this is another thing that Hansa has been looking at. Uh, and uh, we need to really rethink the model, in my view. We need to be innovative. The Royal Commission, as you said, entitled their interim report, Neglect. That is not a word anybody wants to hear when they are dealing with the aged care sector, if they have a loved one there. Mm. And it's, it, it's a real indictment on the sector and it, it needs really serious review. And we need to be innovative and we need to be thinking outside the box. I've got a few ideas, but I know that our other panelists, our other guests, um, will be focusing on that. So is that okay as a bit of a... That's, a yeah, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Jed. And I think we'll come back to a couple of the issues that you've raised there, but that was kind of a, a good big picture overview of where the sector has, um, has gone awry. Um, I'd just like to give a shout out to everyone who's joined us today. We've got 623 people uh, participating. So thank you all for joining us. Um, Ruth Kesterman, we'll come to you next. Your organisation, Holdsworth Community, provides care to older Australians in their homes across Sydney. Can you introduce us to how this system works and if there's been any changes to the way you operate? And I guess what people will be interested in is how the pandemic has affected your team and, and the people that you work with. Absolutely. Thanks, Ebony. And yeah, I'll take the opportunity to also acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the beautiful land that we work on at Holdsworth, um, the people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, Holdsworth's been a really integral part of the community for more than 75 years. And we are really passionate about helping older Australians to stay living in their own homes and as really active members of their communities for as long as they want to, basically. Um, so we, we really welcome this conversation um, and, and, and I guess the attention it's getting and it's, it's long overdue. Um, uh, the, the pandemic, um, <clears throat> the COVID-19 pandemic has only um, increased, we've only seen an increase in people's determination um, to stay living at home to, through the final stages of their lives. Um, and unfortunately, what we um, uh, come across and what we're supporting people in is a system that we see um, does funnel people into residential aged care. Just to give a, a, a brief overview of, of, I guess, some of the barriers that we see people face who want to stay living at home um, and who need support to do that. 
Um, the, the federal government system um, is called the My Age Care System. <clears throat> it is, uh, it, it's a telephone internet based system. Um, it, it's very complex, complex to navigate for any of us, uh, let alone those who live with dementia, might um, be hard of hearing, or for example, who um, English is not their first language. Um, that's the first barrier for people, their families. Um, it's, it's complex to access. <clears throat> Now, when they do access it, they, they are assessed for different um, levels of, of support, so different um, complexity of, of need. Um, there is about 15% of the aged care funding goes to really low level supports. Um, so they might be community based supports like shopping um, and outings, transport. <clears throat> now, if you have high level supports, you then are given the option um, to apply for a home care package system, uh, home care package or get a place in residential aged care. So what we see is that 65% of the funding um, goes towards residential aged care and, and less than 15% to home care packages. So really, if you want to stay living at home, you're competing for a much smaller amount of money. And Jed mentioned the, the waiting lists, um, the 10, you know, 100, 100, more than 100,000 people. Um, so really, you know, there are huge barriers to even access those packages. Uh, the other thing we're seeing is um, what you also alluded to is, is the commercial system that, that has been set up. So the federal government talks about it quite openly as a free market system. We, we, um, it is described as a consumer directed care system. So we see older people, we talk with them and their families, they are set up as consumers in this model. <clears throat> now, again, we're talking about people who might have been waiting for a very long time for a package. They may have very complex needs. Um, the reality of them, <clears throat> excuse me, having the information and the capacity and the time to shop around as a consumer for a quality provider is, is, is just, it's not always realistic. Uh, at the same time, there are a lot of providers out there. Um, Jed also mentioned that it, it's, it's an open market. There's full profits, um, uh, varying levels of quality. I think the government has set up this model to regulate quality based on the fact that it's consumer driven. Um, so people can choose their own provider, move providers if they're not happy. Um, and they, they think that that will regulate quality, but the reality is it, it's not. We see, um, many older Australians with a home care package provider that's not delivering quality um, and is not giving value for money. So I guess that's where we, we see um, the great opportunity to um, offer more individual personalised supports for older Australians. I think um, community organisations like Holdsworth, um, not-for-profits uh, who are integrated as part of the community, I think we have a lot to offer. Um, programs like HomeShare, which I know Beres will talk to more, um, uh, they, they not only um, you know, respond to the individual needs and preferences of older Australians and their families, but they tap into the existing assets that we have in our communities. And the result is great outcomes for, for individuals, but also cost savings for government, um, uh, you know, um, some of the supports um, will have been proven um, that, that participants will be less likely to, to present at hospitals, they'll be less likely to use emergency services. We all know social isolation is, um, generates health um, issues. Um, so some of these innovative, um, flexible, individualised supports can, can really be not only effective for the community, but also cost effective the government. Um, yeah, so uh, um, around COVID, we've seen a huge increase in demand for our informal supports and our different programs like HomeShare. Um, and I know Beres will talk, talk more about that as well. But um, yeah, we're just so, so um, pleased that this conversation is happening um, here and in many other forums. Thanks very much, Ruth. And that does take us to you, Beres Campbell. Um, for those, we've talked a little bit about home share now, but there's probably many people who are on this webinar who may not have heard about that as a concept. Can you uh, explain what home share is and why it's important to the aged care sector? Um, 
thrilled to be doing this, Ebony, and, and I'd like to really just say how totally gobsmacked I am that here we are all talking about a hot topic for the first time in my entire career being aged care. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I would ever see it, but it is fantastic to have aged care front and centre in a really positive way. And I mean, I know a lot of the talk is really critical, but it's so positive that we're even talking about it and that mm. we're really trying to say, wow, we've got to do this better. We can't go backwards. And if we do go backwards, we've got to go back to what was good because we did do some really, really good stuff. And as an elder of the aged care industry, I'd really like to sort of, have a shout out for the fantastically creative work that set up what is now an aged care industry. It wasn't an industry when I was a bright, cheery new social worker back in the 70s. And, you know, back in, in that time, the drive for helping people to age well at home and stay at home and stay in their communities all came from the community, from people wanting to help each other from volunteers who delivered the meals, who came into the nursing homes and you know, became involved in the life of the home. And we, I was really most fortunate in being in a fabulous community of Port Melbourne, which um, is a place, you know, almost unique and special. But in the whole sort of area where we um, built local government services in aged care back in the 70s and 80s. There was incredible community development and community engagement that brought out the best of people. And, and I've got to say that one of the good things about the pandemic, and of course lots of people have commented on this, is a bit of resurgence of that old sense of being good neighbours and looking out for each other. And a program like HomeShare really fits into that mould extremely well because the best HomeShare programs are ones that are really embedded in their local community where the people trust and know the, the organisation that's running it. And so I'm having a huge struggle in my old age of coming to terms with the commercial world of the aged care sector. And the whole sort of competitive, um, non-cooperative um, way of working, I just find extraordinarily hard um, to work with. And so that pricing models and pricing lists and getting your service, billable hours, is just a really big issue in terms of bringing back into the sector a sense of passion and wanting to really see the community work with its older residents in a respectful and dignified and engaging way. Um, so that's my uh, rant for the day. <laughs> yeah, I will ask you specifically though, what is, Home share. home share. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so home share is really about two people helping each other. A home householder who can be an older person or in our uh, programs at Home Share Melbourne, we're broadening the householder mm -hmm. range to include people with disability, um, people who've just got spare rooms in their home who would like to help someone who's at a disadvantage. But essentially, it's about a householder who's got room to spare being matched up with and carefully matched up with someone who would like to live with them and to um, maybe do some uh, service or be, provide some companionship in return for a low cost rent or engage in a mutually beneficial way because there are advantages for both. And the home share program managers and coordinators are involved in making sure that people come together safely 
and carefully to ensure successful matches. And that's what we've been really working on for the last 20 years. And it, home share's not new, it's been around and particularly in this sort of um, agency assisted uh, form of service, um, it sprung up in the 70s in the United States and passed across the, um, the Atlantic to the UK in the 90s. And then we got to hear about it in the late 90s. And it's been growing now over the last 20 years and is now in about 17 or 18 countries. So, you know, it's, it's a movement that's been gaining momentum and why is it gaining momentum? Because it actually works. It really does bring people together and it does strengthen communities. And so it's incredibly worthwhile initiative to uh, promote. And the biggest issue in it is that it does need to be done well and done safely. And to do anything well, you've got to invest in it. And that's, of course, what we've been banging on government doors and philanthropist doors for the last 20 years, because to develop a program of this nature requires a very good um, experienced practitioners who can do home share well. And so my hope and our, our submissions to the Royal Commission is that we have now got a really strong conversation going with um, the Commission, which I'm sure they didn't think they were going to get in this deep <laughs> into <laughs> the whole um, area of shifting the culture that is sitting behind um, aged care. And that's what we've really got to try and revitalise a, a culture that's about really working cooperatively for the for the benefits of everybody really stronger communities so um, that's my big does, bang for the yeah. day <laughs> thank you um and we'll move uh shortly to questions from the audience but um yeah i was going to say that's uh it is a different model but you can see how it does solve multiple problems australia has a big housing affordability problem as well so you can really see the virtues of a program that can you know do multiple things at once. And, uh, you know, as a single person who lives alone with her cat, <laughs> uh, it's really nice to hear that there are options, you know, that don't involve me mouldering away in an old residential uh, capability <laughs> in my old age and that there are other options out there if I can't convince all my besties to come to the same aged care facility as me when I retire. Um, so I do think um, that's a really important thing to unpack and to know that there are other options out there to residential aged care. Um, but a lot of the questions that we do have are coming in from the audience now. Um, and I think we've got about 650 people who've joined us, so a few more since the start, um, are about aged care, I guess, as a whole and, and what's happening to the, the funding and the regulation of that system. So we'll cover a couple of those questions first. Um, Jed, I think this first one might be for you. It's from Megan Flynn. She is asking, where can we get an annual detailed analysis of the funds going into aged care from federal and state governments, as well as the fees paid by individuals, and get greater transparency about where all the money is going to and I guess whether or not it's being spent effectively. Mm. So the um, Department of Aged Care or Aging, I should know that tonight, um, okay. they do put out a report, an annual report that is quite a detailed report about the sector. Um, it has um, data in there about length of stay which is getting shorter and shorter, the average length of stay, um, which is an indicative I think of the, um, the complexities of people going into residential aged care. Um, it does give um, the, the data that uh, facilities have to give to the department about their financials, but I think uh, what you find is that it's very broad and uh, it's very hard to dig down into that data and really see uh, what is actually spent on care, what is spent on capital, what goes into profits, what is used to subsidise other 
parts of their business or their corporation. And this isn't only the for-profits. I mean, we saw with St. Basil's that amazing um, bit of information where the church owned the property and ran the nursing home, but the nursing home paid rent to the church. That was way above um, uh, market rates for a rental property of that price. So, you know, and, and that sort of has come out with people investigating and looking around. So I think um, you can get a lot of information about the sector, but what concerns us is the actual really digging down the transparency, the accountability of taxpayers funding, you know, how much is spent on food, how much is spent on staffing and uh, how much is spent on care. You know, when you hear about staff who are given one pair of gloves for the day and expect that is supposed to be their PPE for the day in the pandemic, well, then, you know, that is ridiculous. You, we all know that you're supposed to take your gloves off between each episodic care, between each patient, each resident. Um, and yet that sort of detail is not really provided. Uh, I think we, you know, as um, I think Ruth explained about my aged care, if you are investigating um, uh, nursing homes where you might want to place a loved one. I have tried to do this with my sister-in-law and for my mother-in-law. You try to look for the local nursing home. It's not listed on the My Aged Care website under the name that's on the front gate. It's listed under the, sometimes under the overall big company or corporation that owns it. And who would know that? I wouldn't know, wouldn't know that. So, and I kind of should be in the know about things like that. It's, it's very complex. The whole system is complex. It's very hard to find information out about an individual facility when you are trying to uh, work out whether or not you would like to use their services. Um, it, it's the whole system really is geared towards protecting that provider's um, business model, the the information, the you know where they um, how they manage that business, rather than giving information to us so that we can make informed decisions and. Uh, it just, in, for my uh, view, you know, Anthony Albanese has announced an eight-point plan to reform the sector, uh, what needs to be done immediately, and high up on that list is transparency and accountability so that we can see very clearly where that money is spent and how it's spent and publication of information about individual facilities, like um, uh, everything that you would possibly need to know from staffing levels through to how much they spend on food each day. Yep. Yeah. Mm. That does seem pretty important to know. Um, Ruth, I think this next one might be for you. Helen Kilbar has, or I'll, I will just say, I've got two people here, Rose Reed and Andrea Wittick with their hands up. Um, Rose, I might come to you next. Um, if you didn't intend to put your hand up, if you press that icon, uh, I'll know that you didn't mean to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, this next question is from <laughs> Helen Kilbar. She says self-management of um, HCP has been amazing for her mum and she's been able to put together a team that has kept her out of hospital and safe and happy through COVID, um, but that very few providers encourage self-management um, and those that do provide minimal consumer facing tools. And her question is, what do you see as the future of self-management? I think, uh, oh, Ruth, sorry, go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll answer briefly. Um, yeah, look, I, I think um, that's a great question. And, and I think um, it's, as we've talked about, it should be one of those really viable options for people who want to have a home care package. We talk about self-management. We talk about shared management um, uh, for people who, who um, might not um, want to or have the capacity to entirely manage. Um, you're obviously doing an amazing job for, for your family member, but, you know, those who, who might not have all the capacity, the time to do that. So having a range of options, as I said, that can respond to the individual um, circumstances of, of older Australians is really what we think should be the future. Um, at the moment, I think, yeah, there's um, providers, the majority of providers are not open to that concept. Um, they're not as um, concerned about outcomes for the individual but as you said you know they've got a business model to run to and unfortunately you lose the nuances on being able to to have um, control o over that funding which is should be um, going towards services for older Australians really. Jed did you want to add something to that? No no I agree with Ruth that's um, and I just saw somebody um, pop up there um, I think 
self-management is important. Um, and in a perfect world, you know, because we view them as consumers and not as people that just need care or as part of the community, I love that, Beres. I loved how you brought in the whole, this should be about building stronger communities. You don't have perfect knowledge sometimes. Do you find that, Ruth? Like you don't really know exactly. what you, well, Exactly. You don't know really what, you know, you're presented with a brochure and you think, oh yeah, that sounds, that sounds okay. But maybe, you know, it, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm saying sometimes you don't really, a person may not really be able to, to do that. That's why I think home share is a beautiful option because if somebody is there with you all the time or is in the house, those little things like you, maybe you didn't know that you needed assistance paying your bills online because it's the only way you can pay bills these days, you know, or, um, and that you've got a young person in the house who can help you with the IT sort of thing and say, oh, it's okay, I can set that up for you. Like, you know, that's one of the, was the biggest things that my mother-in-law had to overcome when her husband died because he paid all the bills online and she had no idea how to do that. So yeah. it, it's complex working out your own self-management needs sometimes. And I just think we need to be aware of that. Not saying that we shouldn't do it and it shouldn't be self-managed, but I think there needs to be an awareness that it can be hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think what people want and need is a trusted, trusted um, provider, someone that can advise them, walk alongside them, as you say. Um, and yeah, we've seen home share as, as an amazing um, option for people not, um, and layering on formal supports as well as having that informal, that person at home to, to keep them connected, to do small chores around the house, but then still getting that, that um, home care package support on top of that. Um, we have a couple, um, uh, uh, um, someone living with, with dementia and that's working perfectly for her because she's still engaging, she's got that shared life, but she's also getting the clinical supports that she needs. Yeah, um, the, sure layer. yeah the layered, layered effect is... Well, yeah, that brings me to my next question, which is for you, Beres, uh, and then, Rose, I'll come to you after that. Thanks for hanging on there. This question is from Heather Lawson. She says, how can we get government to fund more home share programs across Australia? And perhaps you could give us an idea of how big home share is at the moment. Uh, I, I wanted to also say that there's a really encouraging um, move coming out of the work being done by the Royal Commission, um, which is to finally bring together the Commonwealth Home Support Program and the aged care packages, which have been operating separately, which is sheer madness because the objectives of that whole group of things is to really uh, support people from early on in when they don't really need care and support. They need um, engagement um, to be less isolated. They need to be part of their community and so that they can start with active ageing initiatives that have been part of the Commonwealth Home Support Program and move through a continuum as your needs and supports change through to the ultimate, you know, uh, high levels of packaged care. And if you, if you bring something like home share into the equation early on as a, um, uh, as an, an additional support to, particularly for people living alone, but also for couples where there's just need to support each other and uh, the help of having, you know, another young, strong person to help lift someone up or all of those elements. If home share comes into ageing well, and I really like us to think about aging well as a continuum, not declining to needing care and support, but aging well, that you can start with initiatives like home share that um, are very normal things of just having people living together and supporting each other, and then build on those with additional paid skilled resources as, as you grow. And, and that's the most important um, underpinning philosophies that I hope 
will be really addressed and the principles of doing that when the Royal Commission look at these proposals um, that are in the um, discussion paper uh, for the current hearings where um, they are looking to increase the um, change, uh, the funding for the care, the home-based care sector. So, I mean, at the moment, there is no um, funding system for uh, home share, which Heather Lawson's asking about. In, in Victoria, we really did really well because we had a really very strong and engaged aged care division in our state government department back in the uh, in the noughties and so that we were successful in gaining um, HAC funds back in uh, 2009 to continue to grow and experiment with the home share program. But Victoria was the only state that did that and we expanded uh, that with the support of the aged care division in the HAC program in 2012-13 and which was growing really well across all of Melbourne and then in 2015 the Commonwealth took over aged care which from the Victorians perspective was a real backward step because Victoria was really doing aged care well and particularly <laughs> in its relationship between local government and uh, the state government, so that we had strong networks of home um, hack services. And so it wasn't surprising for uh, our home um, hack program to support the home share initiative, but it's lost its leadership since the uh, Commonwealth took over and which has been really frustrating and there is a real need. That's why we're so keen to see home share acknowledged within the uh, basket of services because it does need to have a, an injection of funds to start it up. And then it can start to work towards being a fee paying service, but you can't start a business without a, a seeding grant and that's been a really inhibiting factor here in Australia. Thanks, Ferris. Um, the next question is from Barbara Lyle, although I will just remind everyone, Rose dropped off there, but if you would like to ask the panel your question live, use the raise your hand function, and I'll call on you in a second. Um, <coughs> Jed, this next question is for you from Barbara Lyle. How can we back, uh, bring back a more regulated system with more fully trained nurses, a larger ratio of trained nurses to residents, and more transparency about how funds are spent. Well, we've kind of already touched on that. <laughs> yes, well, the, um, the, new, the 1997 Aged Care Act pretty much removed reference to um, uh, staffing levels and nursing care in residential aged care facilities and uh, didn't set any minimum requirements. So uh, we've made it very clear that we being the opposition think that this is something that needs to change that there does need to be minimum staffing levels uh, There needs to be a proper skill mix of people working in those residential aged care facilities I don't think you'll be surprised with me coming from my nursing background um, That I would be very supportive of that. Uh, there was a view that um, and it's you know Going into a residential aged care is not just babysitting and it, it means that you need care and you need people who have, have a range of skills working in not just nurses and carers, but also access to doctors, access to um, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists. You know, there's a wide range of professionals that do need to access residential aged care facilities. How do we make sure that happens? Um, well, that's part of what the Royal Commission is looking very carefully at, and there's been lots of suggestions. And one thing that really appeals to me is um, the interface that we have with our public health system, which during the pandemic you'll notice has actually what been one of the biggest cracks. Like, do we send people from residential aged care facilities into the state hospital? Don't we? Do we leave them in? There was a, a lot of confusion about that connection with our public health system, which of course is run by the states. It's not run by the, the federal government. 
uh, I'm very attracted to a model that has a really good connection with our state hospitals. And in some areas in, you know, I had to be proud, I am from Victoria, but I do know that there are some models in Victoria with some of the hospitals who have um, units that actually go into aged care facilities and assist with the healthcare um, in those facilities. I mean, it's good for the hospitals because it means that resident, residents don't get sent in an ambulance to emergency departments and it means that they can help um, keep an eye on the, the medical and healthcare needs of the residents. So there, there's lots of different models being portrayed, but I think from a very basic level, we need minimum staffing levels and a minimum skills mix. Although somebody said to me the other day, but Jed, why would you be asking for minimum staffing levels? Surely you want maximum staffing levels. <laughs> So there, there might be a little bit of need to nuance that language uh, around that, but I think people watching this would know what I mean when I say Yeah. Fine. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got to work on the language there. Uh, yeah, so that is definitely something that I think the Royal Commission will be putting a great deal of focus on. Um, is there anything, Ruth or Beres, you'd like to add the, um, no, to no, that too. question about regulation? Look, I, I just wanted to add that, and I see there's a lot of comments on questioning whether, you know, you can respond to high needs or complex needs in the home. And I think we should all challenge ourselves um, to see how we can do that. And, and I think we possibly haven't been um, as much because the funding is, is certainly weighted towards residential aged care. But we, we, we can see that it can happen with the right supports, with community nursing, um, those specialists out in the community, um, that can happen. And um, yeah, I'd like to see um, that being supported more so that we can actually see communities that have older people living amongst um, all the other uh, groups in the community. So children can see older people around, they're not locked up in, in institutions, that really we get the benefit of them being part of our community. And yes, it might not be easy, uh, might not be something we've done as much in the past, but let's let's try and do that. It's possible. It certainly is possible. Ruth, sorry, Ebony, can I just quickly add to that? Um, a lot of people have come to me and said something that would really help them would be day day respite and saying really be incredibly happy to have mum at home with a bit of support um, in the home. As but I just can't leave her when I go to work, mm -hmm. and I would love to. Be cared for perhaps somewhere in my community um, mm. in a day respite type of situation, uh, which with the stretch of the imagination wouldn't be that hard, I think, to establish. What, 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 what do you think about, I'm interested, what do you think? Oh, am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about that? that? That comes up all the time for me, for people in my community. I'd keep mum with me if I could have some, somewhere for her to go during the day. We uh, I mean, Holdsworth, that's been the majority of the supports that we offer in our community to older people and their families. Um, we um, often, you know, there's, it's not only the respite, I guess, or, or the opportunity for, for families to be able to work, et cetera, but it's also um, engaging um, older people with, with, you know, new friends, with their local community. We, we are quite committed to being out and about. We're, we're not keen on a day centre model. Um, and, and that is for people who live with dementia, um, you know, wide range of people. Or it might be a safe environment where they can engage with other, other parts of the community as well. But that is absolutely um, possible um, and, and definitely something that we hear a lot as well. Yeah. Um, and, and I also think there has, we have had as a society a, a big focus on productivity and we're all working more, we're all um, busier. And, and, and the flip side has been that all these uh, normal, um, informal supports we used to do uh, and care for our family members or our neighbours, um, that, that's disappeared. And now, and now we find we're paying for that and, and seems to be a bit... Um, Bit of a strange outcome of that, but um, yeah, I think I think we can definitely um, bring that back. Um, yeah, and, and I mean, home share can play a role in that too. And I mean, um, Holsworth have got a really good example that featured on Compass um, on the ABC's Compass program, where um, the uh, householder. Um, mm -hmm really lived with her daughter, even though it was a, a big house and she had a separate wing. 
but she was really lonely in the day because the daughter and everyone went to work. And so, you know, Wendy recruited a retired woman uh, who lived with then as a home sharer and was able to be there or to take the, ha the older person out. So, you know, that's another enormous mm. value for, mm. for home share. Mm. Um, and I see in the chat that those, those services do exist and I acknowledge that, but I just think we don't invest in them broadly. That's right, yeah. Um, that brings me to my next question, actually, that point that Ruth was making about, um, you know, that a lot of care used to happen in, like, within the home uh, and was unpaid and now we're finding ourselves having to pay for those services. So the next question is from Fred Sim, who asks, what are the panelists' thoughts on the ongoing major role played by the for-profit sector, in particular listed providers in the sector, if it's already underfunded? How can we realistically expect a good outcome if funds are being extracted for shareholders or otherwise? Um, Beres, you've been in the aged care sector for a long time. What's your observation on the role of for-profit providers within the sector? Gosh, it's a big topic, Ebony. Mm -hmm. um, because I do think that the big ones like uh, Bupa, Unite, um, Australian Unity and Regis, and I mean, they're all highly motivated to provide um, wonderful accommodation and a lifestyle uh, for people. And so that the, the, the values underpinning the commercial for-profit sector are fine. Um, I think it's very difficult though to um, put monetary value on the sort of things that we're talking about of engagement with community and you know keeping relationships um, front and center and um, I think that's particularly hard when you've got to keep I mean, of course, you've got to keep your eye on the bottom line, but if you're also trying to keep your eye on the profits, it shifts the balance of how you think about and weigh up the options and how to go. I, I'm not a good person to talk to about um, running things for a profit because um, I've never done it. And, um, and not very good at, at thinking about it. But I do think that it is, it is possible and it does really depend on the culture of the organisations and their relationship with their customers um, and the, the sort of philosophies underpinning things essentially. Thanks, Ferris. Um, that brings me back to the last question that I wanted to ask uh, you, Jed, before we wrap up. Um, at the beginning, you talked a lot about some of the workforce issues that we've seen particularly highlighted from the pandemic and moving from, you know, uh, an area where there used to be minimum standards and, you know, uh, staff to patient or nurse to patient ratios and things like that, and that now we're seeing um, zero hours contracts, um, people having to work multiple jobs uh, to make ends meet. Um, and that in a pandemic, that's actually been quite a, a weakness in terms of public health. Um, but can you just reflect <laughs> on um, some of those workforce issues? And I guess just thinking also about finding ourselves not just in the middle of a pandemic now, but in uh, the first recession that Australia's had in 30 years with hundreds of thousands of Australians out of work and the aged care sector being uh, quite employee, uh, employment intensive compared to something like um, the mining industry. I think uh, our, one of our senior fellows, Dave Richardson, calculated that you're five times more likely in the community to run into an aged care worker than a coal miner. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's very intensive in terms of employment and that's what we need more than anything else at the moment is to employ people. Um, what are your observations on where we go from here in terms of um, fixing some of those workforce issues? Yeah, um, I think that across the whole aged care spectrum, um, and I don't think my panellists would disagree with me that when we are talking about 
increasing um, community work health in, 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 this, um, in this sector, uh, the, and as well as residential aged care workers. We really need to remember when we're calling for consumer focused care and for self-managed care that at the end of that request, there is a worker. Mm -hmm. And um, often the response to that type of approach has been um, people calling for the need for a very flexible workforce. So that, you know, if somebody says, oh, I, only, I really only need two hours of care a day in my home, somebody has to provide that two hours of care. And if that's the only two hours of care that they can provide, that's not a very good living for that person. Mm -hmm. So whilst I totally 100% support self-managed care, we have to have a system that also supports workers um, that gives them the dignity of decent income and decent work. And that's hard. That's hard to do that. So I did notice in um, Hans's submission to the Royal Commission, you highlighted the need for minimum hours for workers, um, reliable jobs and steady, steady income. Steady income is so important. If you don't have a steady income, you can't get a housing loan. You know, you find it even hard to get rent, to rent a property. You can't afford to buy a car or get a loan to buy a car, which means you probably can't go far to work, which then, you know, minimises the hours you can work because you can't get access to workplaces if you're in that system where you have to move around. So I think with um, community care and um, home care, we have to be really cognizant of the, the impact on workers if we are to move more into that area. In residential aged care, it's similar. We need minimum staffing levels. We need to minimise the impact, the need for people to work across different facilities, which means we need to offer them decent jobs. And uh, that needs a lot of work. We need minimum qualifications, as I've said before. Uh, I think your comment about the future post pandemic, I think I was really pleased today. I don't know if people saw in the, in the media today, but um, the Labor Party have announced some initiatives that they want to take coming out of uh, the pandemic. And I, the focus on the care economy is very strong. You know, it, it's a huge employment area, as you say, predominantly women, a lot of women work in the area uh, and predominantly low paid casual and I think it's an area where if we really are thinking of stimulating the economy, then we need to focus on that, uh, making sure that those jobs are well paid, that they're secure jobs, and that they provide quality services to the people who need them, the care of the, the services that are provided by people in those jobs. I think it's going to be about, what, 150,000 people at the moment, is it, employed in the aged care? Does that sound about right? I think there's about 150,000 people, maybe more, maybe. Um, and uh, certainly if we are going to boost up quality of provision of care, then we're going to employ more people, we're going to need to train more people, make sure they have the skills and that they need to go into the sector. And it is going to be a huge stimulus opportunity. I hate to talk about aged care, Beres, in terms of econ economic stimulus. But <laughs> I know. If, if, if you are, I mean, that was the frame of the question, Ebony. It and I, is, yeah. I think you're right, and this is an area absolutely that can help with that. Same with disability services uh, and uh, the public services that we offer broadly. I think the care economy, massive opportunity for us economically. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a growth industry. It is the, very. The care economy. Yeah. Um, as long as the, uh, the values stay strong and the culture is um, motivated by the care industry, not the financial industry. Yeah, well Don't said. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, but thank you so much to all of our guests today. Jed Carney, Member for Cooper and Shadow Assistant Minister for Aged Care. Ferris Campbell from Home Share Australia and Ruth Kesterman from Holdsworth Community. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. That was a really thank great you, discussion. Thank you, thank you to everyone. Thank you bye bye. Soon. Thank you to everyone who has uh, joined us with their great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them today, but hopefully you found that to be an interesting discussion. And please join us over the next few weeks for some more exciting webinars. Tomorrow at noon, we'll be talking to Rod Sims, the chair of the ACCC, about Facebook, Google and media diversity and the new media code. Uh, next week, we'll be talking to Catherine Murphy about her quarterly essay, The End of Certainty. Scott Morrison and Pandemic Politics. You can register for both of those at our website, tai.org.au forward slash webinars. 
and make sure that you're subscribed to our podcast, Follow the Money. You can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. In this week's episode, we talk about bringing forward the income tax cuts and why that's a poor idea uh, in terms of fiscal stimulus during a recession. And please remember, stay one and a half metres away, wear a mask if you can, keep washing those hands and stay safe out there, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today and thanks again to our guests. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.